I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Well, today we are going to explore two themes, uh, actually, one about being hooked on devices and programs and our modern world, and the other is how to become indistractable. If that's a new term, well, today we're going to explore that, and it's really something that I think we should all be focused on. I've often said that we are like kids in a sweet shop with our technology, which has grown exponentially in our lives over the last uh, 20 or so years. And we still haven't quite worked out how to get the most out of our lives while still using it. We are not going to give up uh, technology. We have to learn to live with it. And we have to learn to live with it in this modern world. Well, my guest today is Mir Eyal, whose work and writing is an intersection of psychology, technology and business. He calls it behavioural design, and we will be exploring that term in this podcast. Nir is an author of two wonderful books, both of which I have read, called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Boy, if that's ever throwing down the gauntlet to us all, I think that's a book we all need to be reading. He has an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and lectured in marketing at that Graduate School of Business and Design School, the Graduate School of Business and Design School. He worked in the video gaming and advertising industry where he learned and applied techniques used to motivate and manipulate users. So if anybody knows about how we are hooked, this is the man. He helps companies and individuals create behaviors that benefit their users while educating people on how to build healthful habits in their own lives. A challenge for us all. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Nir Howe. Welcome to the show, Nir. Thank you, great to be here with you. Nir, um, there's so much I wanna talk to you about. I was very excited that we got to speak uh, because through a mutual mutual friend, uh, Jocelyn Brewer, who I had the pleasure of speaking to recently, on the podcast. Um, And I know that you use the term behavioural design. And I've got a feeling that we all either enjoy or suffer from behavioural design. I wondered if you might just share with us what that actually means. Sure. So behavioural design is using consumer psychology to influence behaviour to form healthy habits. Uh, So we don't want to ever create addictions. It's not about creating addictions. Addictions are very different from habits. Uh, The goal of my work is to build the kind of products and services that people want to use, but for lack of good product design, don't use. And so this is uh, the kind of products that you might use to help form an exercise habit or perhaps to get you to remember to take your medication or help you save money or help you learn a new language. We can use the same technologies that uh, are used by Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and Slack, uh, not only for frivolity, but to help us build good behaviors and good habits in our lives. Wow, I mean, uh, that's, that's, there's a lot to unpack there because we've, got a, we've confronted with these kind of things and choices all the time. And, and uh, you've written two books and I'm looking forward to talking to you about both of them. Um, I, I, I first picked up Hooked Uh, The title grabbed me, well, it's probably a good idea, but how to build habit forming products, which is, you know, tell us, given what, tell us about that book, tell us how you came to write it. Yeah, so I was looking for how is it that uh, so many of the products we use are so good at getting people to use them? (laughs) What is behind uh, products like? you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Slack, WhatsApp, uh, Amazon, Google, the list goes on and on. These mostly tech-based products, that's what interested me. What is it about these products that makes them so sticky? How do they get us hooked? And so the idea here was not to write the book for their benefit, right? Mm -hmm. They were already using these techniques. They didn't need my book. My goal was to democratize their techniques by uh, uh, 
exposing them so that the rest of us could use them for good. And that's exactly what I've done. So since the book was published, uh, we sold over half a million copies and it's been used in every conceivable industry from healthcare to fintech to education products, the list goes on and on. Uh, and I'm an active angel investor. So I look for the companies that utilize this work. And uh, uh, my profession is finding these companies and helping them grow. Uh, so some of my portfolio companies uh, include companies like Canva, a company based where you are. <laughs> yes, and we use it's, it. We use it. It's a wonderful product. Exactly. How it's does a, it work? I mean, how, well, how is it so wonderful? Well, it's mm. because it's designed to be wonderful. That didn't happen by mistake. It didn't happen by accident. Uh, products like Kahoot, the world, one of the world's largest educational software products, a company I was lucky enough to invest in, that has touched the lives of millions of children to get them hooked to education. So we really can use these same exact techniques uh, for good, not just for frivolity. Now, I know people are going to rush out and buy that and read it, but if you were to give us a couple of things about what it is, what is the common denominator that gets us hooked? Sure. So it's really about this four-step process that I call the hooked model. And uh, the hooked model is a series of four, four uh, steps in the user experience that through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how our habits are formed through these technologies. So it starts with a trigger. There are two kinds of triggers, external triggers and internal triggers. External triggers are the pings and dings that we have in our outside environment that prompt us to action. The next step is the action phase of the hook. It's defined as the simplest behavior done anticipation of reward. It's scrolling a feed. It's play, pushing a play on a YouTube video. It's a quick Google search, the very simplest thing you can do in anticipation of reward. Then comes the reward itself. And typically that reward is variable. There's some kind of uncertainty, some kind of mystery involved with that, uh, that reward. It's the same type of uncertainty that uh, keeps us glued to a rugby match or uh, helps us want to finish, the, finish a great book. Uh, it's it, you know, uncertainty and variability is the core of what keeps us engaged to many entertaining experiences as well as in many of the products and services we use. So that variable reward is a key component. And then finally, the investment phase, which is where the product gets better with use. The more we interact with it, the more valuable it becomes. So as opposed to most products that depreciate with wear and tear, when you think about your car, your furniture, your clothing, all these things lose value with wear and tear. Habit forming products do the opposite. They don't depreciate, they appreciate. They get better and better the more they're used because of this principle of stored value. So by investing in the product, we actually make it better. That's a, that's a cardinal trait of these habit forming products. So that through successive cycles, through these four steps of the hook, eventually we begin to form an association with an internal trigger. And that's where the habit really takes hold. What is an internal trigger? We talked about the external triggers earlier, the pings and dings. An internal trigger is an emotional state that we want to escape from. So everything we do, every product we use, we use for only one reason, and that is to modulate our mood. So a habit forming product has to attach its use to that uncomfortable sensation. Uh, so for example, when you're uh, lonely, you check Facebook. When you're um, uncertain, you Google. When you're bored, oh, lots of solutions to boredom, right? You can check stock prices, sports scores, the news. Let's worry about somebody's problem thousands of miles away so we don't have to think about the discomfort we're facing right now. So many of these products, in fact, all of the products we use, we use to escape some kind of emotional discomfort. And so a habit-forming product, whether it's something that leads us towards you know, a, a time waster or something that helps us uh, form a good habit, always has to attach its use to an internal trigger. So that through successive cycles, this is how our tastes are formed, how our uh, habits uh, are shaped. Wow, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, with products like Canva uh, and, and uh, Kahoot, I just love that, you know, it has been so well designed to take me on that journey. But so much of our interaction um, is not like that, is it? We, and, and, I, and I guess, and I, I, I read your book, The Indistractable, which is the next book, and I always felt like, is this the flip side of the same coin? You know, is this now telling us how, you, how it was you got hooked, but indistractable? And I love that story you shared in your book about your daughter and spending special 
time with your daughter. Yeah. I wondered if you might just share that with with us and then lead sure. us into the book itself. Yeah. So uh, shortly after I published Hooked, I uh, was with my daughter and we had this one day plan, just this beautiful afternoon. And um, I we had a, a book about different activities that dads and daughters could do together. And one of the activities was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember that question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said. Because in that moment, for whatever reason, I don't even know why, I decided it was a good time to check my phone. And by the time I looked up from my device, I realized that she was gone. Because I had sent her a very clear message that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. And she left the room to go play with some toy outside. And I realized that as a father, I had blown it. I had a perfect moment and I got distracted. And if I'm honest with you, it didn't just happen with my daughter. It didn't just happen at one time. It would happen when I would say to myself, I'm definitely going to go exercise today. I'm definitely going to work out. But I didn't. I'm certainly going to eat healthfully today, but I wouldn't. I'd sit down at my desk and say, okay, I'm going to work on that big project I've been procrastinating on, but I delay. And so what I realized that it wasn't just about uh, being with my daughter, it happened in several areas of my life. And frankly, it wasn't just about the technology that I was getting distracted from all kinds of things that I said I would do. And I wasn't living with personal integrity. You know, something that's very important to me, I'm sure it's very important to, to many of your listeners is to be as honest with ourselves as we are with others. But unfortunately we lie, we lie all the time to ourselves. We say we're going to do this. We say we're going to do that. We're going to exercise. We're going to save money. We're going to eat right. We're going to spend more time with our loved ones. We're going to focus at work. We know what to do. We just don't do it. And so that's a, that's a new phenomenon. You know, for most of human history, people could throw up their hands and say, well, well, I don't know what to do, right? How do I do that thing? I have to go to the library. I need to go ask some expert for the secret. Well, today that expert is at google.com. <laughs> just ask Google, whatever it is you want to know how to do, the answers are right there. So what's our excuse? Why don't we do the things we know we should do? Who doesn't know that if you want to uh, live more healthfully, you have to eat right and exercise? Do we really need a diet book to tell us that? Who doesn't know that if you want to have better relationships, you have to be fully present with the people you love? Who doesn't know that if you want to be better at your job, you have to do the work, especially the hard stuff that other people don't want to do. So the question isn't, what do I do? The question now in this century is why don't I do the things I know I need to do? Why do I get, keep getting in my own way? That was my problem. And so the question is, why do we keep getting distracted? That is the skill of the century is becoming indistractable, being the kind of person who lives with personal integrity and does what they say they're going to do in business and in life. Yes, well, that is perhaps our biggest challenge almost from birth, but certainly I can see it in my own grandchildren at the age of two, three, four, five. And, uh, and, and I am just as guilty of it as well. And we are all getting distracted. And part of the problem, I come back to your first book, is that too many people have, have distra distracted. I mean, the distractions have never been greater. Is that, I think oh, that's yes fair. And no. okay. Yes and no. I mean, I will agree with you that distractions, if you are looking for distraction, they're easier than ever to find. But remember, distraction is not a new problem. Plato talked about this very same problem 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years before the internet, before the iPhone, before Facebook, people were complaining about how distracting the world is. And every generation has their moral panic. You know, when I was a kid, it was about the television and rap music and Dungeons and Dragons and comic books and radio. I mean, just how far back you wanna go. <laughs> every generation thinks it's something outside themselves and blames whatever technology du jour uh, has been invented. And you know what? That's never the source of the problem. We love mm. to blame those things, but that's never the real source of the problem. There's always something deeper going on. Because look, the price of progress is that things get better. If you want to live in a world where you're in Australia, I'm in Singapore, we're talking for free over these magic video phones. I mean, can we pause for a second and take a look at the world we live in right now? I mean, how much better is our world than just a few decades ago? Imagine if we went through COVID-19, if it was COVID-90, 
Let's imagine the year 1990, and we have tried to go through the past couple of years without these amazing technologies, without Facebook to connect us, without WhatsApp, without Zoom, without these amazing technologies. Can you imagine how much worse this whole disaster would have been? It was bad enough. It would have only been worse. So the world is getting better, right? There, there are these new technologies. Now, do these technologies have downsides? Of course. Paul Virilio, the philosopher, said, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. Of course, there are going to be problems with these technologies, but this is nothing new. We can overcome this if we believe we can. The biggest problem I see today, the biggest problem is that people are buying into this myth that technology is addicting you, that it's hijacking your brain, that the big bad tech companies are making these products that you just can't stop using. I am here to tell you that is absolutely rubbish. It is not true unless you believe it's true. If you give them the power to say, well, it's addicting me, what can I do? Look at my kids, they won't stop playing video games. What can I do? You know what people do? Nothing. It's called learned helplessness. And when people believe there's nothing that can be done, they do nothing about the problem. And when I, that was initially my reaction was, oh, it must be the technology. Look, I keep using the technology. The technology is distracting me. Well, but this is everything we do these days is on technology. So you can't blame the technology for the source of distraction. So here's what I did. I actually got rid of all the technology, right? Before I wrote this book, you know, what I, what I tend to do is I don't ever write a book unless I can't find a book that already solves the problem for me. So I went to read all the other books on this topic and they told me about, you know, uh, digital detoxing and just get rid of your devices. And I did that. And I sat down at my desk, I got myself a, a, um, a word processor from the 1990s with no internet connection. I got a flip phone, right? For that, you know, those, those one of those $12 things you can buy on Alibaba that we used to have in the early 2000s. So I bought those things with, because they had no apps, you know, no social media. And I still got distracted. I would sit down at my desk and say, okay, I'm going to write. Nothing's going to distract me. I'm just going to focus. But, oh, there's, there's that book on the shelf I've been meaning to read. And, you know, look at my desk. Gosh, what a mess. I should clean up my desk. Let me take out the trash real quick. And I kept getting distracted. You know why? Because distraction isn't about what happens outside of us. The vast majority of distraction begins from within. And so it wasn't until I could understand that cardinal principle about what is the deeper psychology of distraction. It's not the devices, people. I promise you, get rid of your devices. If you don't learn how to be indistractable, I promise you, whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much food, too much Facebook, too much football, you're going to find a way to distract yourself unless you understand how to become indistractable. Well, I'm, I'm looking, I mean, I'm reading the book and, uh, and I'm actually enjoying it. I, I am enjoying it. But I think there are some challenges there. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, every generation has said, you know, when when, we were, when radios were introduced, this was going to be the end. When TVs were going to, this was going to be the end. Uh, I think the thing that's changed now is that with algorithms and the fact that even if you got rid of your device, I'm almost certain that the very first person you came into contact with after you got rid of all of that would have had devices and you're surrounded by it. And these devices, because of algorithms and clever programming, end up knowing us better than we know ourselves. In fact, you know, the, the, the work of Yuval Noah Harari, which I'm sure you've read, yeah. and he talks about, you know, this whole challenge where technology actually hacks us, where it knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's mm -hmm. probably, the, I mean, our mothers use, he said, makes point, our mothers used to know yeah. us better. That's right. But, yeah. but where's, where I, that's? I love that point. I, I just want to interrupt you because I, yeah, I, I, I really, I, before you go too far ahead, I love his point because it makes my point. Okay. You know, Harari talks, I'm a big fan of his work, yeah. uh, but I think he's got this one wrong. And I'll okay. tell you why. You know, he talks about how it used to be our mothers know our needs. Our mothers anticipate what, what, what we require. Um, but here's what happens. When we're babies, that's true. When we're incapable, when we're, you know, useless infants, we can't, we can't fend for ourselves. Our mothers do uh, understand what we need. But what happens when kids get older? What happens when we become teenagers and our mothers tell us what to do all the time? What happens? Yeah, sure. Where am I going with this? What do we do? We rebel. Yeah. So here's what's happening. People all over the world are saying enough, enough. I'm not going to hold my breath and wait for these companies to change because they're not going to change. Their business model, just like 
every media's business model, whether it's the newspaper, the television, they all monetize your attention. So what exactly is it that the algorithms are doing that's so, that makes us incapable of changing? Can, can you tell me? What is the algorithm doing that makes it impossible for us to turn off the stupid notifications, to uninstall the apps, to, how about this? Here's a newsflash. Decide what you will do with your time ahead of time. Yeah, can, look, can we not do that? I, look, and, <laughs> and, and that's why I have been so, that's why I'm re reading your book, but that's why I'm, because I actually do think our relationship with technology um, is a bit like, we're a bit like kids, we are all, of all ages, like kids in a toy shop or a sweet shop. We've discovered this, we've discovered that, we want this, we want that. I want that too. I want this as well. I want to do that. And other. We haven't really learnt how to deal with it. And that's why this book is so, you know, this issue of right. managing our, our ability to be distracted is just everyone's biggest challenge. I, I mean, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, but here's the thing. It, it is not an insurmountable challenge, right? That no. as good as the products are at getting us hooked, and look, I wrote the book Hooked. I know all of their tricks. <laughs> and I will tell yeah. you, they're good. They're good. They're not that good. This is not mind control. This is not hijacking your brain. It makes for a wonderful headline. This is why you hear it on the mainstream media. This is why the newspapers and the cable television networks love to tell you about how technology is terrible for you, even though they use all the same tricks on you. They love to tell you how they're terrible because that's their competition. And it makes for a great headline. Again, we love moral panic. So of course the entrenched media companies want to fend off the competition through these hysterics that we eat up. We love this line that the algorithms, what exactly are the algorithms doing? Feeding us more cat videos? Feeding us more political garbage? We can turn that crap off if we believe we can. The price of progress. You wanna live in a world where you have the world's information at your fingertips? You wanna live in a world where you have infinite uh, opportunities to learn and grow and share. You want to live, live in a learn where this stuff by and large is free. You know what? You got to learn some new tactics. Yeah. You got to learn some new manners. You got to learn some new habits. That's the price of this progress. And there will be a bifurcation in this world between people who let their time and attention be controlled and manipulated by others and people who say no. I decide how I control my time and attention because I am indistractable. And that's exactly why I wrote this book. Yeah. And, and this is exactly why we're talking. And uh, I, you know, I'm very open to, to accepting that. How do we get started? Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing is to understand what is distraction, right? What are we really talking about here by understanding this term? So the best way to understand what distraction is, is to understand what distraction is not. What is the opposite of distraction? The opposite of distraction, if you ask most people, they'll tell you it's focus, but that's not exactly right. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, they, it comes from the, the root word trahare in Latin, which means to pull. And you'll notice that, that the word ends in A-C-T-I-O-N, right? Distraction ends in action, reminding us that distraction is not something that happens to us. It is an action that we take. So if you ask yourself, what is the opposite of distraction? It's not focus, it's traction. Traction is any action that pulls you back to that same Latin root, pulls you towards an action that you intend to take, okay? It is anything you do with forethought. It is an action that pulls you towards your goals, towards your values, helps you become the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of traction. The opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction is any action that pulls you further away from your intentions, further away from your goals, further away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. So this isn't just semantics. This is very, very important because any action can be traction or distraction. Let me give an example. So for years, when I got into the office, I would sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, now I am not going to get distracted. I am going to work on that task at the top of my to-do list. And by the way, we can talk about why to-do lists are one of the worst things you could do for your personal productivity. We'll come back to this in a minute. Yeah, good. I would take that task at the top of my to-do list and say, okay, now let's get to work. Let's do that one thing. Nothing's going to get in my way. I am not going to get distracted. No more procrastination. Here I go. I'm going to get started right now. But first, let me check some email. Right. <laughs> Let me check that Slack notification. Let me do those three or four things. Right. Exactly. Those three or four things may be at the bottom of my to-do list, 
just to get started, right? Those are all work-related tasks. I'm being productive. I got to check email at some point today. And what I didn't realize is that that is the most dangerous form of distraction. Forget about Facebook and video games. The most dangerous form of distraction is the distraction you don't even know is taking you off track. It's obvious if you're playing a video game or checking Facebook, maybe you should be doing something else with your time. What you don't realize is that if you are checking email, when you said you would be working on that big project, you are just as distracted. Even more so, because distraction tricks us into prioritizing the urgent and the easy work at the expense of the expense of the hard and important work we have to do to move our lives and careers forward. So that's distraction. Anything can be an act of distraction if it's not what you plan to do. Conversely, anything can be traction if it's what you do with intent. So don't listen to these chicken little tech critics that tell you, oh, the sky is falling and all these technologies are melting your brain. BS. If it's what you want to do with your time, why is watching a rugby match somehow morally superior to playing a video game? There's no difference, right? Just because one is new, just because one is what the kids are doing, <laughs> that doesn't make it you know, better or worse. If you want to play video games, if you want to watch television, if you want to watch YouTube videos, if you want to go on Instagram, do it, enjoy. There's no guilt, there's no judgment. Let's not moralize and medicalize perfectly normal behavior, enjoy it. But do it on your schedule and according to your values and nobody else's. Right? Because the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. Dorothy Parker said that. It's okay. If you want to do that stuff, that's fine. But do it according to your schedule and your values. So now we have traction. Now we have distraction. Now let's talk about the triggers. Right? We talked a little bit earlier about my first book and, and uh, the progress I made in my research around triggers. We, let's go back to these two types of triggers. The external triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings in our outside environment. And then we have the internal triggers. These these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from. And studies find that only 10% of the time that you check your phone, 10% are you checking it because of an external trigger. The other 90% of the time that we check our devices, it's because of an internal trigger. And time studies have verified this. And 90% of the time that you check your device, it's because of what you are feeling, not because of what's happening outside of you, what's happening inside of you. So to answer your question, long-winded uh, setup. No, no, good, good. <laughs> now we have our four steps, right? So we should have a picture in our mind here. Distraction, traction, internal triggers, external triggers. Now we follow these four points of the compass and we have our answer. Step number one, we master the internal triggers. If we don't master those uncomfortable emotional states, they become our master. Number two, we make time for traction. If you don't plan your day, somebody's going to plan it for you. And you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Number three, we hack back the external triggers. Of course, the media is trying to hack your attention. So is your boss. So are your kids. All kinds of things in your outside environment are trying to grab your attention for their benefit. That doesn't mean we can't hack back. We can fight back by taking steps today to prevent getting distracted tomorrow, by doing simple things like turning off notifications, changing our computer interface, using technology to fight technology distraction. I'll show you how to do all that stuff. Hacking back email, meetings, Slack notifications. We can hack back each and every one of those external triggers step-by-step. Step. Finally, the fourth step is to prevent distraction with pacts. And this is where we use what's called a pre-commitment device to make sure that as a Last resort, as a firewall to prevent distraction, we have a strategy in place that makes it more difficult for us to go off track, more difficult to get distracted. So when we use these four techniques in concert, mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back external triggers, and preventing distraction with pats, this is how anyone can become indistractable. Well, I mean, one of the internal triggers, which are accounting for 90% of our distraction is the fear of missing out, isn't it, really? I mean, that's, sure. that's one of our biggest challenges. And it could be that it could be anything as inane as a social interaction, but a news, uh, something. Fear of missing out is one of our biggest challenges, isn't it? 
It, it sure, certainly, it, it definitely can be. We're a very social species, <laughs> and whether it's you know, I remember in middle school, if you're you know, if your friends don't invite you to hang out, uh, or you don't get invited to that party, it feels horrible, right? You feel that that the, uh, social exclusion. We hate that feeling, and of course, uh, today we can find that uh, that fear. You know, fear is an uncomfortable emotional state, it's certainly an internal trigger, and we can look for relief from that in all kinds of ways. I mean, the external triggers, in a sense. Uh... You know, I, I, I've got that about turning off notifications. You know, I mean, if you were had notifications on for your emails, messages, uh, Twitter, every one of them, you, you wouldn't have time in your day for anything else. You'd just be checking your phone all the time, which if we travel on, you know, we go around our, our world. Yeah, it's actually it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. You know, I, I it, with the good. OK, I'll tell you what drives me crazy. and I'll tell you some good news. It drives me crazy when I see families in a restaurant mm. and all, you know, they're, they're having a meal together and everybody's using their devices. But you know what? That's not the devices. That's poor manners. Right. Like, yeah. You know, my, my family, I'm embarrassed to admit this. When I was growing up, we were doing the same thing around the television screen. Right. If mm -hmm. seven o'clock, oh, Seinfeld's on, everything stops. <laughs> we all got to go watch Seinfeld. Right. Like, we've always done these bad behaviors, these bad manners. The good news is that that is evolving. That in fact, when I taught at Stanford at the Graduate School of Business, the younger my students were, the better their tech manners. Still today, actually, when I have a, a consulting engagement with a company that's learning how to become indistractable and they call me in for this big, expensive uh, you know, workshop. You know who the person is who's checking their phone in the middle of the meeting? It's not the junior staff. It's the big, important boss who wants to show everybody how busy they are. That's the person who's on their device at the wrong time. So these are about manners. These are about learning to spread what we call social antibodies. Social antibodies is when a society realizes that there's a aversive behavior that we have. And we learn these new norms, these new manners, these new ways of being around each other. We adopt these new behaviors so that we can prevent uh, this social harm. So I, I do think it's changing, but it's, it's such a simple thing. You know, how can we possibly complain that technology is hijacking our brains and addicting us when we haven't even taken five minutes to change those notification settings, really? And it's easier than ever. You know, the tools today, how crazy is this? The device manufacturers have features built into the phones to help us use them less. Name me other products that the manufacturer of the product will design into the product ways for you to use the product less. Which That's is pretty the, rare. Which is the switching off notification, which is the monitor. What, tell us some of those things. I mean, I know. Sure. Uh, off a monitor. great feature is do not disturb while driving. Yes. Okay. Everybody's phone comes with do not disturb while driving. Now, they don't have to know if you're driving. <laughs> right? Like, well, so just for folks who are not familiar with this feature, it comes on pretty much everybody's phones today. It's standard. It doesn't cost you anything. What this feature does is if you're the kind of person who says, okay, yes, I need to do focused work, right? Yes, I need to be indistractable. I need an hour in my day to think, which everybody should give themselves at least some time in the day to work without constant distraction. You engage this one little feature, you push one button. And if someone calls or texts you, they will receive an automatic reply that says, I can't talk right now. I'm driving, right? That's what the feature was developed for. By the way, you can change that feature. Mine says, I can't talk right now. I'm indistractable. But if this <laughs> is urgent. Why am I not surprised to hear that? One? Right. You can change it. You can make it whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. That automatic reply, right? It goes out automatically to them if someone calls or texts you. And it says, if this is urgent, text me the word urgent. And if they type in, if they spell out the word urgent and hit send, then the call or text message will come through. How simple is that? So if, oh my God, your house is on fire, you have to call me right away. Okay, you'll hear about it. I've been using this tactic for over three years. Nobody calls, right? People can wait five minutes. It's our, oh, this is why it's so important to understand those internal triggers. The vast majority of the excuses that people make, and I've heard all of them. I mean, what about ism? is large and in charge. What about this? What about that? My situation is special. What if this happens? And people shoot themselves in the foot trying to figure out all the reasons why they can't work without distraction because maybe the one in a million thing that might happen that they might need to respond to as opposed to realizing it almost never happens. And they just give away their power of attention and focus out of the whataboutism of maybe, maybe, maybe there might be something I need to respond to. And that's a big, big mistake. These tools are designed into our devices to help us stay focused. We just need to use them. 
You mentioned schedule, and I know you talk about schedule management. Talk, tell us a little bit about that. What, what is managing sure. our schedule? What are some pearls for us there? Yeah. So, okay, the, the first step, again, is mastering the internal triggers. That's the yeah. most important step, that if you don't know what to do with that emotional discomfort, you're always going to find distraction somewhere. But after we've learned some of these techniques that we can use whenever we feel that discomfort, the second step is to make time for traction that you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you have a big open calendar, if you use a to-do list, and we can talk about why to-do lists are so horrible. I know I yes, mentioned that I'm, earlier. You mentioned yeah. it, and it's my ears picked up. I want to hear that, but go on. I'll, I'll tell you why. To-do lists, it turns out, are one of the, and let me be very clear. I'm not talking about keeping a to-do list, meaning taking things out of your brain and writing them down. That's good. Taking things out of your brain, putting them on a piece of paper and an app, very good. What's bad is running your life on a to-do list. If you look at your calendar, I'm sorry, if you look at your to-do list, before you look at your calendar, you've made a big mistake because to-do lists have no constraints. You can add more and more and more. This is what people have. They have a to-do list that's a mile long and they're productive throughout the day. But here's the thing, they get home from work and they look at their to-do list and they still haven't finished what they said they were going to do. And what does that do to our psyche? What message does that send? When I look at these things that I said I was going to do, these commitments I made to myself and I didn't do them, loser. So day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, I am reinforcing the self-image of someone who doesn't live with personal integrity, someone who doesn't do what they say they're going to do. And that takes a toll. And then eventually people start saying this nonsense of, I'm no good with time management. I have an addictive personality. I have a short attention span. You start hearing this ridiculous narrative that people tell themselves, which of course then they conform to because they think they're somehow broken. There's nothing broken about these people. It's simply that we're using a broken technique much rather than using a to-do list. We want to keep a schedule, keep a calendar. And by the way, I didn't make this up. This is one of the most well-researched pieces of personal productivity advice that almost nobody uses, unfortunately. And the, the real uh, people who, who, who are top of their game in almost every field do this. And that's why they're at the top of their game. They decide in advance how they will spend their time because you can't say you got distracted if you don't know what you got distracted from. So if your calendar has white space on it, what did you get distracted from? You didn't decide what you were gonna do. <laughs> Everything is a distraction. So you have to decide in advance how you want to spend that time. So that's, that's a very, very important criteria. And how do we do that? We do this based on our values, okay? This is how we get started. Many people say, well, how do I get started doing this whole time box, boxing mm-hmm. thing? I'm convinced, but what do I, how do I do it? We start by turning our values into time. Now, what are values? Values are attributes of the person you want to become, attributes of the person you want to become. So... Um, and here we have these three life domains that I ask people to take a look at uh, how, what kind of person they want to become in these three life domains, starting with you. You are at the center of these three life domains. So how would the person you want to become spend time on themselves? Okay, now my values are going to be different from your values, and I shouldn't tell you what your values are going to be. But if exercise is important to you, for example, do you have time on your calendar for physical activity? If, uh, you know, uh, uh, being sharp is important to you, right? Do you have time for sleep? You know, we've heard ad nauseum how important sleep is to us. How many of us have a bedtime? We tell our kids they have to have a bedtime, but how many of us are hypocrites and we don't have a bedtime, right? If uh, prayer or meditation or reading is important to you, it's got to be on your schedule. That's the first life domain. The second life domain is relationships. You know, we know that in the Western world primarily, there is an epidemic of loneliness. That loneliness is as detrimental to our health as smoking and obesity. It is a very serious problem. And part of the reason we have this problem is that the time we used to have in our schedules to interact with other people has evaporated along with the progression of uh, secular society. Now, now I'm, I'm a pretty secular person, but I will say that we miss something when we don't have that regular 
you know, Friday night dinner uh, at, at the synagogue or uh, the, the Sunday church group or, you know, whatever the occasion is to bring us together. As society became more secular, we lost these regular uh, social interactions that were held on our calendar, right? Even if it's not the social interactions or the religious interactions, it's uh, the bowling league or the, the uh, Kiwanis club or whatever the case might be, Toastmasters, those times on our calendar when we interact with other people. The good news is we can bring that time back. So don't give your most loved uh, people in your life the scraps of time that are left over for your kids, for your siblings, for your parents, for your spouse. Book that time in advance. Have that time held and preserved for the people you love most. And then finally, the last life domain is your work. And work separates into two categories. We have what we call reactive work and reflective work. Reactive work is reacting to all those pings, dings, and rings, right? It's the, uh, the meetings, the, the, the Slack notifications. That's reactive work. And many people feel very comfortable not having to think about what to do. And so all day long, they allow themselves to do reactive work. Not only is it very stressful work, but uh, it, it doesn't help us do our best work because you cannot do your best work without making time to reflect. You can't be creative, you can't problem solve because you can't think if you are constantly interrupted every 30 seconds. So for God's sakes, you've got to protect at least some time in your schedule for that reflective work. Because if you don't, you're running real fast in the wrong direction. So those are those three life domains that we can use to fill our calendar. And then, and this is what to-do lists can't do, we have to make trade-offs. Because unlike on the to-do list that has no constraints, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. So this technique forces you to ask yourself, what am I gonna do more of, what am I gonna do less of? And by the way, I want you to do the fun stuff. You want time for television, you want time for video games? Awesome, put that in your calendar too. But it forces you to make these trade-offs so that you understand, hey, what is traction for my day? The things that I plan to do with my time and everything else, that's a distraction. Mm. I mean, the reactive one is so obviously going down the email and social media rabbit hole, which could take up your entire time. It's um, it's interesting because I what I'm hearing you say is you know fill out the schedule, be conscious of the 24 hours and plan it out. And and I'm and I often when we talk about nutrition, I talk about carb counting carbs, and I go well you have to you have to set aside two weeks to actually measure food and get your head around what you're doing. Is this how and I say, well, you don't have to measure that for the rest of your life, but you have to measure it to get your head around it. Is scheduling just a part of life that we just have to be, we have to accept that in this modern world, that's what we have to be doing? If that's what your values dictate for you. So okay. if you want a life of spontaneity, I'm not going to tell you not to. <laughs> it's your life. But then don't complain to me that you got distracted. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. because that, that is the thing, isn't it, about decision-making? And you talk about values here, but people often um, talk about decision-making and, 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 and the balance between that and spontaneity, or rather the scheduling and the balance between spontaneity. Right. So, but look, I, you know what I do? It's, it sounds like an oxymoron, but I actually schedule spontaneity. How do I do that? So okay. let me, for, okay, <laughs> so that's my good. daughter, and I don't schedule every you know, second of, of my day, but I know, okay, here are the buckets of the things that from this time to this time, this is what I want to be doing with my time. So, for example, um, when I am with my daughter, okay, on Saturday afternoons, we have a big time block of, of you know, one o'clock to five o'clock where we don't know what we're going to do. So why do I need to schedule it? Well, I schedule it because even though I don't know what we're going to do, you know, we, we, we're going to be spontaneous. We might go to the museum. We might get some ice cream. We might go to the park. I don't know what we're going to do. But the point is the reason I block off that time is because I know what I will not be doing. I will not be checking email. I will not be taking a work phone call. I will not be checking social media because that is time I have dedicated to be with someone I love very much. So having that time blocked off and knowing that is going to happen, that time is reserved for quality time with my daughter. That's a very important step. Now, what we do with that time doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's all, it's about excluding what I will not be doing at that time. So if I find myself, oops, I'm checking my phone or whatever. Now I know that's a distraction because that is not what I plan to do with my time. Wow. Nia, you've given us so much to think about and so many pearls there. And I and that's, that's why I've read, you know, got both of your books. And obviously anybody listening to this has got to 
got to got to read it. You know, there's so Thank many you. pearls in there, <laughs> and and the issue of distraction is huge. Um, if you were going to leave us with uh, two or three pearls and getting going in this, you know, mm. give it to us. Give us some. Sure. Uh, you know, I, th- I think the the important thing to remember here is uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna summarize this entire book into one mantra, it's this: that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. That when it comes to the problem of distraction and procrastination, it's not a character flaw. You know, many people think that there's something wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with you, okay? Procrastination, distraction, it's not a character flaw. It's not a moral failing. It's simply that we haven't learned how to deal with these impulses, how to deal with these impulses that lead us away from what is actually consistent with our goals and our values. So it's really about learning how to Uh, how to find impulse control. And how do we do that? The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. That if you wait till the last minute, they're going to get you, right? If you uh, wait till the chocolate cake is on the fork and you're on a diet, you're going to eat it. It's too late. The chocolate cake is on the fork. If you wait till the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're going to smoke it. If you sleep next to your cell phone every night, it's the first thing you reach for in the morning before you say hello to your loved one, it's too late. Then of course the social media companies are gonna get you. Of course, it's too late. What do we do about it? We use forethought. Now that is one of the, the, the traits of our species that makes us so special, is that unlike any other animal on the face of the earth, we can see the future with higher fidelity than any other creature that roams the earth, right? We can predict what is going to happen. So don't wait till the last minute. Take steps today to prevent getting distracted tomorrow. And I don't care how amazing their algorithms are, how great their devices are, how addictive or how distracting, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not even a match. We are so much more powerful than they are if we take steps today to prevent getting distracted tomorrow. Yeah, what a what a note to finish on. And thank you so much for joining us today. I, I've loved talking to you. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. And to have the opportunity to speak to you has been terrific. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, Ron. Thank you. Well, that conversation just dovetails so perfectly into the conversation that I started with Jocelyn Brewer just recently about digital nutrition. But this is so much more than that. And I mean, um, it's interesting that Nia has written these two books, Hooked and uh, Indistractable, and uh, whether they are... um, the opposite ends of the same coin. I think actually indistractable is so much more than that. And I'm really enjoying reading it at the moment. And I would really recommend that to you as well. It's, it's a challenge for us all. Are we spending our time on ourselves? You know, this is a big part of, of this podcast's message about taking control of your own health and prioritizing. And I was just um, reflecting on the fact that, Whenever we talk about sleep, and there's so much information about sleep, the most important part of you getting a good night's sleep is for you to prioritise it. Unless you think it's important, all the rest is just academic. And to this, and this is exactly the same too. We have so many distractions in our world, in our lives, but it's about values. And as and as uh, near so beautifully articulated. It's about you, it's about your relationships, and it's about work. And when it comes to work, it's about is, your, is the majority of your time at work reactive or reflective? And we all know that if we go down the rabbit hole of, of emails and uh, face all these other social media things, it's a rabbit hole that is very reactive. And we should be spending more time at work reflecting and being indistractable. Look, we're going to have links to Nir's uh, website, Near and Far, um, and his wonderful books. Uh, I hope you found that as stimulating as I did and certainly inspiring. Uh, I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.